Matthew chapter 25, let me flip over there. Verse number 14 says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Verse number 16, Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise he that had received two, he also gained other two. Let's read verse 18 together. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. Verse 20, together. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents. Verse number 21, his Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. Verse 23, together, his Lord said unto him, well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast, that is thine. Verse 26 together. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest, therefore, to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Verse 28, Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Verse, verse 30, Together. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oftentimes this verse is, or this passage is used to talk about uh, Christian service, right? And uh, those types of things and not to waste your talents. The conundrum I see with that is the last guy gets thrown into hell, right? So if that is the case, then we kind of see a work salvation, right? So if you worked enough and you, you, you produced enough, then uh, God rewards you. And those that don't produce get cast into hell. I think uh, the lesson could be there is though, that those that are saved will have fruit, right? You shall know them by their fruit, the Bible tells us. So if, you're, if you are a child of God, there will be fruit. There will be things that come out of that. Uh, and those that are not children of God uh, do not have fruit, right? They, do not, they have unrighteous fruit, but they do not have spiritual fruit. And so as we see in the next, the, the next parable, we see the wheat and the tares, right? Those that look like they're saved, they fit in with those that are saved maybe, uh, but they're tares. And so Jesus says, hey, don't, don't pull out the tares with the lest you pull out some wheat, right? And so he's like, at the end, the angels will come and they will separate the wheat from the tares, right? The tares will be thrown into the fire. We're not going that direction at all tonight, but that's just that, okay? We're going to be talking about stewardship, stewardship, managing God's resources. And you're like, oh, Dylan, we're going to talk about money tonight. No, we're going to, we will touch on money just momentarily, but that is not, that is a very minimal part and it won't be necessarily the direction you'd think. But nevertheless, with money. Steward, steward. We see this Lord comes, this master as how it's used here. This master comes and he makes these men stewards, right? We don't necessarily see the word in this parable. We see the concept where he comes, he gives them something. Interesting, I looked it up in the talent, at least what it, it had in the, the one dictionary was like a hundred pounds of silver, right? That's, that's a lot. That's like, imagine just somebody 500 pounds of silver just getting dropped in your lap. Like, that's a lot of, it's just a lot of, like, what do I do with this, right? There's 500 pounds of metal. Uh, anyways, uh, but a steward is the manager of a household or house or of household affairs. Um, a manager in general, a superintendent, whether free born or was usually the case, a freed man or a slave. We see interesting, Paul identifies himself as this, right? In Romans chapter 1, Paul is servant of Jesus Christ, a slave, of, uh, somebody who is, who is bound by him. 
And we see Paul obviously was a, 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 sir, a slave and a, a prisoner. We see in other passages Paul a prisoner, and he was a prisoner of Rome, but he calls himself, what, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. But we see here oftentimes this was a, a, a freed slave that maybe was a bond slave now or a slave that was not a freed slave but was put into this service to be a steward of the household. So a superintendent to whom the head of the house or proprietor, or pro, proprietor has entrusted the management of his affairs the care of receipts and expenditures, and the duty of dealing out the proper portion to every servant and even to the children not yet of age. So we see here stewards, they are not owners, right? They're stewards. They don't own anything. Uh, that the, everything is the master's. Everything is the Lord's. In this case, whoever their master is, they, they don't own it. They have no possession of it. They are simply there to manage it. And in this, this parable we just read, to uh, make it better, right? To have fruit from it, to go invest it and make more. And to take the master's money, the Lord's money, and produce and make more and return it back to him. We would see in other passages to bear fruit. Uh, we see some people bear a hundredfold and some uh, different types or different amounts of fruit, right? And that's what a steward does. They're not owners, they're stewards. First Corinthians tells us, For the earth is the Lord's. This is also in Psalms and in, another, in a, and in another epistle. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We think of the song, God owns the cattle on the thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. He owns the rivers and the rocks and rills. The sun and the stars that shine, I think it is. Wonderful riches more than tongue can tell. He is my father, so they're mine as well, right? But it's all God's, right? The fullness thereof, everything. He created it, it is his. He is the owner. A steward, though, is responsible to the owner for how he handled what he was given to manage. We see your ownership oftentimes produces pride. And not, and not always in a negative sense, but you have pride in something, right? You have a pride in your business, a pride in the thing that you own, the pride in the thing you developed. Stewardship, though, produces humility because you know this is not yours. And in this case where a servant would receive it, there was nothing he did to earn this necessarily. When it comes to salvation, when it comes to the gifts of God, uh, there's nothing that we've done to earn them. Even the benefits that the Bible tells us he daily loadeth on us, it's not like we were good enough to get them. It's not like we didn't do enough, we did enough good and not enough bad and so God gives us things. That's not really how it works, right? He gives us grace and the definition of grace is what? unmerited favor, right? God's riches, God's riches at Christ's expense, if you will, right? Uh, there's nothing we've done to earn it. Even the grace after salvation, the blessings we receive, this is not from something that we were just good enough to get it. God's blessings, no. If we're truly honest with ourselves, there's nothing good that we've done to deserve those blessings, right? The blessing of sitting here tonight in a temperature-controlled room with comfortable seats, right? Living in the United States of America, being able to eat whatever and wherever and whenever we want to eat, right? I just, I, I it, it must be like mind-blowing for people from other countries to come here and like just go to a Walmart. Just, just a Walmart. It's not even that great, right? <laughs> all right, much less like whatever. But it's a Walmart. Like there's all this stuff, right? That you just can go get anytime. All this food. Just, in, you know, massive, massive. You want a jalapeno? You get a jalapeno in December. Like why can you, you know, just on and on it goes, right? Amazing things. But if we're honest, these are, these are unmerited things. God owns these things. And sometimes we live like we're owners when we should be living like we're stewards with God's things. We need to shift our thinking away from ownership of life to stewardship of life. When the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, that includes me, right? That includes you. Um, he's not speaking of other things other than you and me. He's speaking of us as well. We are in that. Creation. We are in that fullness thereof that God owns. We need to shift, like I said, our, our thinking to stewarding life. Areas of life that we need to steward that we are going to discuss tonight. There's eight of them. I don't know if we'll get to all eight. Time, money, uh, our words, our spouses, or our marriage relationship, our children. Relationships just as a whole. Other relationships outside of, of spouses and children our ministries, our church, and the gospel. So what are we stewards of? Number one, time. Our time is not ours. Our time is God's. He created it. If you turn over to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter number 1.
It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. Verse 4, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first, what? Day. God created time, space, and matter here in this moment. We are responsible to God for how we spend our time. We've probably heard the statement before, what? Time is money, right? Time is money. So how do we budget our time? Do you take account of your time and how you have spent it and how you will spend it? Some budget money very specifically. I wish I did better. This sermon is for me. <laughs> but how much more scarce and important is the resource of time than money? Do you budget time as well as you budget money? Shouldn't it be budgeted better because it is of greater value than money? You can always go get another job. They make more money every day. And they just literally just hit control P and more just prints every day. And it gets less, of less value. But nevertheless, they make more every day, right? You can always save a little money. You can always pick up some side work, some side hustles, right? At the end of the day, you can go mow grass, shovel snow, rake leaves, go make a quick buck, right? But you can't get back time. Once that passes, it's gone, right? So when it comes to our time, how much time is given to God each day, every, each week, each month, each year? Do we consider, I have this much time, and I'm giving this much to God? Or do we just like go with the flow, and then we look back and think, oh, I gave enough time to God, or I didn't give enough time to God? Do we consider, I have this much time, and I'm going to, on purpose, give this time to God? Or once again, do we just go with the flow? How much time is given to your spouse? Once again, you only have a certain amount, right? You are on an allowance, right? It's like when your parents would give you an X amount of dollars. Quick story. So when I was a kid, when I was a kid, we had a microwave. Like, that's a normal thing to have. And so we had had Chinese the night before. And um, no one had told me that metal can't go in the microwave. And so I put that little Chinese packet with a little wire rim on the top. You know what I'm talking about? which is the same, it's the same exact wire that's on a paint can, but the paint can weighs like 10 pounds and that thing weighs a little, anyways, I don't know why they do that, but, so I put that in the microwave and all of a sudden I look in there and this thing's just on fire. Biggest tragedy was it ruined my fried chicken, but it's on fire. Fortunately, it was recently fire prevention week at school, so I knew where the fire extinguisher was and I grabbed it out from the sink, opened it up, sprayed it, put the thing in the sink and it was just black. And uh, there's like that little plate that sits on the top of the microwave and all the little brackets that held it were like melted down and it was burnt all inside and I burnt the microwave and all that to say, I used to get, I got an allowance before that, I think it was like two, $2, I was gonna say 200, yeah right, $2.50 a week and after that I did never ever got an allowance again to pay for the microwave. The most expensive microwave in the world. $2.50 years later, I mean that adds up really quick and microwaves aren't really that much. Whatever, not sure. I can't <laughs> but how much time is given to your spouse? How much time is given to your family? Do we look at this and think, I have this much time. I have an allowance. I have a certain amount of time. There's only so much. You're never going to get any more. Do I budget? Do I give a certain amount? Do I steward the time God has given me well? Or do I just live with it flippantly? How much time do you give to improving yourself? And I'm not talking about like all this self-help stuff to some extent, right? But reading, learning, growing, improving in all areas. I was thinking about this lately. We, we, wear, we wear different hats, right? We're a husband. We're a, we're a father. We're a Christian. We're a brother. We're a friend. We're all these things, right? And in your job, then there's all these other hats that you, that you have in your job. All these things you're having to learn. Are you improving in these areas or do we just stagnate and just stay here, right? We don't, but we don't use any of that time that God's given us to improve, to become better, to better ourselves, to be a better person. 
to be a better husband, to be a better dad, to be a better friend, to be a better Christian, to be a better follower of Jesus, to be a better soul winner, to be a better giver, to be a better this, that, or the other thing. Do we read? Do we study? Do we get around people? Do we learn to become better? Or do we just stagnate? Or is there any time being given to bettering ourselves to be the person God desires for us to be? How much time is given to serving others? Do we set aside time? We think about the story of the Good Samaritan, right? And it's a great story, and we think, yeah, that's how I would be. But unfortunately, how often are we the priest and are we the Levite? That's all the way in the left lane, because we got to get somewhere. We're so hard on the priest and the Levite. They probably were busy. I mean, they're walking to the road to Jericho, right? They probably weren't going for no reason. They probably had somewhere to go. They might have been in a hurry. They probably left on time, maybe even a little late. I mean, maybe they were Baptist and they left late. Um, I'm just joking. Um, but no, maybe they were just on time. Maybe they had somewhere to go. And I'm not trying to make excuses for them necessarily, but I'm just saying how often are we like, oh, I can't help that person <laughs> because I'm so busy. I got to get somewhere. And it would be rude of me to be late, right, to this thing I'm getting at. or already, I'm already late, so I can't stop. Why? Because we don't ever consider putting time in to help people, to serve people. Are we, are we setting aside time to serve people? I mean, what, it, what Jesus is like, he said, as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. The people that can't help you back, the people that can't love you back, the people that are the dregs of society. If you love those people and care for those people, you know how you love Jesus? You know, you serve Jesus by serving those people without agenda, without precedent, without any of those things. That's how you love and serve Jesus. That's what he said. But do we set aside time to reach out to those people and love those people? Not just so we can maybe get them in church. Hopefully that happens. Not so we can just cram the gospel down their throat. Hopefully we can give them the gospel. But just because we love people. Just because it's good to love people and be there for people and care for people and serve people. Do we give time to that? How much time do we give to rest? God gave a whole day. God didn't need to rest. God didn't need to take a nap on the seventh day because he was worn out from creating the world. No, he set that up for us, right? He set that up to say, hey, you need rest. You need to recharge. You need to rehabilitate a little bit. Do we set aside time for that? Or are we just so busy? Are we so focused? Are we climbing the rat race? Are we in the rat race, rather, trying to climb the ladder so much that we don't take time to rest? We don't take time to consider God and his goodness and the greatness that he's surrounded us in in this world. Are we so busy? Are we so preoccupied that we don't even take time to rest? We look at the Sabbath day and the commandment and the Ten Commandments, and it's emulated after creation. He said, just like God established the day of rest on the seventh day, I'm establishing the Sabbath day in the Ten Commandments. Do we make time for that? So often if we don't make time for these things, we won't do them, right? We have to make time for them. We have to budget our time. The list can and should continue. We have 168 hours every week. It would do us well to monthly, weekly, daily, and sometimes even hourly reckon and budget our time. Time is incredibly scarce, Incredibly scarce. Proverbs tells us, and it's even more scarce than we realize, right? We think maybe we have, we have an expected lifespan, right? We're going to live 75, 85, and these people that live like into their 90s, it's just like, man, that just seems terrible. But like they live really long. But some people die like that. Some people don't make it to our age. It's very scarce. It's more scarce than we realize. Proverbs says, boast not thyself of, the mo- of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. The most important resource we've been given is time. We can't keep it. We can't save it. We can't make more of it. We only have so much. And once it is passed, it is gone. Ephesians 5 tells us, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Colossians says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without Redeeming the time. This means to make wise and sacred use of every opportunity for doing good so that the zeal and well-doing are as it were the purchase money by which we make the time our own. It means to take advantage of every usage of time. That's the first area that we need to steward well. Probably the most important. If we steward that well, we can steward our relationships well. We can steward our time with God well. We can steward a lot of things well if our time is stewarded well. And we, I, I, this, is, this is for me as much as anybody, more so. Understanding the value and the weightiness of time and that we are not the owners of it. God owns you, especially if you're his child, right? What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? What's it say next? For ye are not your own. 
Why? Because you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are whose? God's. It's his time. We need to steward it well. We're not the owners. We don't get to say, well, this is my time. It's God's time. We're merely stewards of it. And we will give, a, we will give a, an account for what we did with the time that we were given. Next, money. All of our money is God's. Period. We're not just responsible for what we did with 10% of our money. We are responsible to God for 100% of our money. All of it is his. Sometimes we pat ourselves on the back that we gave money to the church. Or that we gave money to missions. And it's good. Be generous. Give money. We probably all should give more. Let's be honest, right? And we think like, oh, I, I did it. I put my check in. I checked my Christian box of giving whatever percentage or whatever thing I felt like I should give. Or, and then we move on and we don't live generous lives. We don't ask God how, how we can give more. And some people are more blessed with money than others. Some people are better with money than others. But all of it is God's. And to think like, well, I gave God 10% and I get to keep 90. That's not how it works. All of it is his. You are the steward of his money. Now he says, hey, I want some of it back to put into my ministry, to put into my work. And for some people, they put more. Some people put less in. Some people put none in. But all of it is his money. You are simply the steward of his money. It's not your money. It's his money that he allows you to steward. And you will give a response and a reckoning to him for how you stewarded his money, his time. We're responsible for God, to God for all of our money. We need to be wise stewards of all of our money, not just 10% of it. What do you do with your money? Do you know where it goes? How do you feel about the money God has given you to steward over? Once again, not your money, his money. Well, I worked for it. Who gave you the skill? Who gave you the strength? Who gave you the ability to get up in the morning? Who gave you the ability to suck wind, right? Who put oxygen in the air? It's his money. You may have gone and worked for it. He can manage you to work because you're his. It's his money. Do you act like you're the owner or the steward of it? Are you stingy or are you generous with it? Does money control you or do you control it as the steward? Does God control your money or do you? You are the steward, not the owner. Luke 16 says, If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, the money, right? The world's money. The money that's got somebody else's face on it. As Jesus would say, Caesar's money, right? As we would say, the government's money. Because it, does, it doesn't represent anything at this point, right? There's no gold standard. So it's just a piece of paper. If we're not faithful in that, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And he's not speaking of, oh, you'll get rich. If you're faithful with a little bit, you're going to get super. So the true riches, the things from above, right? The, the heavenly riches, the things that are good, that are like beyond this earth. The things that are way better than what money can buy. Time, our money, next our words. This is, an, this is a big one. Proverbs 18, I'm going to read just a few verses rapidly. Probably not any more rapidly than I've been reading them, but Proverbs 18. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Luke 6 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Ephesians 4 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Proverbs 13 says, He that keepeth his mouth with his life, but he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. And we could go on and on tonight, probably for a good span of time, just reading Bible verses about the tongue, about our speech, about our words, about the things we say. You can never unsay what you've said, right? You can never unsend what you've sent in this digital world. You can never unpost what you've posted. And you say, yeah, I can. Kind of. Unless you're Hillary Clinton, probably not. Most importantly, others cannot unsee or unhear what you've written and said. Others cannot unsee or unhear what you've written or said. You may delete it. You may take it down. You may try to unsend it. If somebody saw it, though, it doesn't go unseen. You, are a stu- you're, you steward your reputation with your words. Right? And we've all done this. I mean, maybe you haven't. I have. We've all done this, right? We hit send, and we're like, ugh. Or time goes by, and that comes back to haunt us, what we said or sent. We've said things, and as they're coming out of our mouth, if we could reach out and grab them and pull them back in, we would. But we can't. Proverbs says, 
Chapter 21 says, Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Proverbs 17 says, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Proverbs 18 says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. We could park there on that verse for a while, right? Hear a matter out before you answer it. I think there's another passage as well that says a similar thing. Don't, don't get just one side of the story and then speak your mind. Don't just get one side of the story and then go, go off about it, right? Hear out the matter and then speak. It doesn't say, I think it says a wise man heareth things and then responds. Doesn't mean you can't respond. Doesn't mean you can't comment. Hear out the whole matter before you comment on it. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and a shame unto him. Silence may be, and often is, silence may be and often is misunderstood, but it is never misquoted. It may be misunderstood when you're quiet, but it's not going to be misquoted. If you didn't say something, people can't really quote you. It's good to hold our tongue. It's good to steward our words. Are you a good steward of your words? Steward of time, steward of money, steward of words. Stewards of our children. One of the most important things we have to steward is our children. Childhood is one of the most formative times, if not the most, in a person's life. You as a parent are to steward that, right? We went over the value of time, and now you're the steward not even of your own, but somebody else's. Somebody else's time. And not only just somebody else's time, but some of the most formative time of their life. It's heavy. <laughs> it's heavy to be a parent. Right? And all you ones that have like older kids, you're like, I know. You have no idea yet. <laughs> just wait. <laughs> but it's heavy to be a parent when you understand how valuable time is and that this is somebody else's time and how, how formative that time is in that person's life that you are the steward of. Very important. Proverbs tells us, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. How are you stewarding your children's life? Their time, their training, their training in money, in learning, in physical advancement, in mental training, spiritual training. You training them to be good stewards of what they have, even as young children, stewarding their money, stewarding their time. Are you doing not just that with yourself, but are you teaching your children to do those things? Their education. You are responsible for your children's education. Unfortunately, we have given this right over to the government, and now they think it's their responsibility to educate your child. It is not. It is my responsibility to educate Clara. It is your responsibility to educate your child. We need to get out of our mind that the government or any other institution is responsible for the development of our child. It is the parent's responsibility. God has put you in that, you, you as the parent of that child, you are responsible for that. You may utilize these institutions for the development of your child educationally, physically, spiritually, but you are the responsible one, mom and dad. Right? We're responsible for our children's development, for our children's education, for our children's spiritual growth, for our children's physical development in certain things, right? We're responsible for that, for teaching them, for training them. We may utilize institutions, schools, church, these types of things, but at the end of the day, you and I are responsible for our children, not those institutions, not those organizations. You and I are. You need to be responsible for your ch children's spiritual growth. The church isn't responsible. The pastor isn't responsible. The children's pastor isn't responsible. The youth pastor isn't responsible. You, as the parent, are responsible to your child and to God for your child's spiritual growth. Once again, you can utilize these places. You can utilize these things to help aid and help facilitate the spiritual growth of your child, the educational growth of your child, but it's your responsibility to do its best and to steward that in your child's life. You can't just throw your kids at the church and expect them to, quote, turn out. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. The church has a portion of your kid's life to steward, but it is a sliver Compared to yours as the parent. To compare to mine as the parent. The church isn't here to raise your kid. That's what you're here for, right? It's not the church's job to raise your kid. It's your job. Next we see here, not just time, not just money, not just kids, not just our words, but our relationships, our friendships. As we talked last week, I don't belabor that point too much, but do you have good relationships? You can only have so many. We know some of these statements here. You are the sum 
or the total of the five people you were closest to. But the house, he used to say, you are or soon will be like your friends. You're the sum, you're the total of the five people that you spend the most time with, the people you're closest to, the people that influence you. That's, that's the total of you. That's the sum of you. That's, that's where you're at. Who are you surrounding yourself with? Are they pushing you? Are they helping you grow in the areas of life that you need and desire to grow in? Are the relationships in your life leading you to the person you desire to be, the person God desires you to be? Think about the areas we've been over. Time, money, what we say, our spouse, our children. Are we around people that are helping us be better in those areas? Helping us be a better dad, helping us be a better husband, helping us be, ladies, a better wife, a better mom, a better friend, a better, a better Christian. Are we around people that do that for us? Or do our friends or our relationship drag us away? Spend time with people that help you improve in these areas of money, time, marriage, child rearing, words, the things we say in other relationships. Are you investing in your relationships and being a good friend? Right? Not only do you have good friends, but are you being a good friend? We talked about this last week about being a good friend. Proverbs 27 says, Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart, so doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not, neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity, for better is a neighbor that is near than a brother afar off. Do you understand the value of the relationship, and are you contributing to it? Right? Don't just be a taker. Be a giver. Right? Don't just suck out of relationships. Invest in them. Right? It's like a bank. You can only withdraw so much before you've overdrawn. If you're not depositing into the relationship, into the bank of goodwill, if you will, into the relationship, then eventually you're going to overstay your welcome. Eventually you're going to withdraw. And that relationship's going to come to an end or be strained because you just, you're just a taker. Invest and put into those relationships. Don't just want good friends. Be the good friend. A man that hath friends must what? Show himself friendly. Next, ministries. The church. Are you involved in ministering and serving others? God is the owner of your ministry. Sometimes we get possessive about these things, right? Sometimes people get, go, get into ministries and take ownership. We would even say this maybe sometimes. We want somebody to take ownership. Or that they would make it their own. Or that they would take possession of it. We must keep in mind, we are not the owners of the ministry that we minister in. We are not the owners of the service that we serve in. God is. We are the stewards of it. It is his. This is not, in the sense of ownership, this is not your church. This is Jesus' church. He's the head of it. He's the owner. We get to come and be the body. We're the bride of Christ. He's the head of the church. He runs it. The body operates under the head because the head operates the body, right? He tells the hand where to go. He tells the leg where to go. He controls where the body goes. He's the head of the body. The ministries of the church are led by Jesus, and he has appointed under shepherds to lead the church. Right? The pastor, the senior pastor, right? First Peter 5 says, feed the flock of God. This is speaking to pastors, which is, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. You see, these pastors give them the oversight, taking the oversight thereof. So when the pastor wants to make a change in a ministry you serve in, or a ministry is added or taken away, or you ask to move to a different ministry, etc., right? Remember, you're the steward, not the owner. The steward, not the owner of that. If you go into a ministry thinking you're the owner, then you probably will act like one, right? Nobody comes into Tyler's business and says, Tyler, you should cut down a tree this way. Right? No, nobody comes into Roy's business and says, Roy, you should build a house this way. Because he's the owner. Now maybe they're right. Maybe he's mistaken. Maybe they're doing it wrong. It doesn't matter. They own it. So when we act like owners, it's hard for people to come in and say, hey, let's make an adjustment. When we're stewards, though, it's easy. Because we're not the owner. It's God's. We're just stewarding it. Next, stewarding the gospel how are we stewarding the gospel? The gospel is meant to be given out liberally and generously. The gospel is not meant to be kept. First Peter 4 tells us, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. As good stewards 
of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things might be glor- may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. O oh, be good stewards of the gospel. The most important thing that we have to give, we can't really give our time. We can, we can help somebody, but we can't like remove time from our day and give it to somebody else. We can't remove time from our life and give it to somebody else. We can give them our time as far as spending it with them or doing something with them, but we can't say, hey, here's 10 minutes. You have it now. We can give people money, but more importantly, we can give them the gospel. Paul tells, or P- Peter tells us here, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, are we stewarding the gospel well? Are we sharing it? Are we living it? Or when the reckoning comes, when our account is reconciled before God, how's that going to stand? We'll be good stewards of what God gave us in the good news of Jesus Christ. I don't know exactly what illustration completely Jesus was speaking of in this parable. The talents. Was he speaking of modern day talents? Like somebody is talented in this thing. Was he speaking about money specifically? I don't know. But we've all been given the gospel at this in this room. You've heard it. I would hope to think everybody in this room is saved. I think I think so. As much as we could we could know somebody saved. And so therefore we've been given a commission to go give the gospel. Are we being good stewards of that? There's no, it's not, it's, it's like a smile. It's like kindness. It's like love. Like the tank is full always. <laughs> and even if we, we take some out, it's full. It doesn't, we can, we can just keep giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving the gospel. We don't, we don't run out. It's not like, oh, hey, but I, uh, I gave, you know, this many people the gospel today and so I can't give it to you because I ran out. No, we, we have an endless supply, right? And God's grace is endless, So are we good stewards of what we've been given? We've been given this endless supply. Are we giving it out like it's endless? I mean, imagine if we had endless money and we could just give it to people. We would just be passing around 20s all the time. I mean, if you had endless money, I hope you passed out Benjamins, not not 20s, but nevertheless. We'd pass out money all the time. We'd be paying for people's meals. We'd be putting gas in people's car. We'd be doing generous things because we'd have endless money. Yet when people's lives are on the line eternally, And we have an endless supply of God's love, an endless supply of God's grace, and we're the ones that it funnels through. We're like, well, turn the faucet off. We'll fill up a little cup, and then maybe, you know, if the if the setting's right, we'll we'll give him a little drink. (laughs) Are we liberal? Are we generous? Do we just like blow the hatch off of the gospel in our lives and let it flow through us and be good stewards of what it is? There's no end. We're not going to run out. The tank's never going to get empty. We're never going to look at it and be like, oh, we're on E. We better slow down. Are we good stewards of it? Moreover, it says, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Are you a good steward of time, of money, of your words, of your relationship with your spouse, your marriage, with your children, friendships, relationships as a whole? your ministries, your service? Are you a good steward of those things? And are you a good steward of the gospel? Do you live your life as an owner or as a steward? If we own our lives, we we can do whatever we want. We're the owner. No one's going to tell us what to do. They may make a recommendation. We may go with it. We may not. So do do we live life as an owner of our life, of our money, of our talents, of our treasure, of our marriages, of our children, of the gospel? Or do we live life as, a, life as a steward? Where God owns everything and he allows us to use it for his glory. Be a good steward of what God has given you. Moreover, it is required among stewards, as you and I, that a man be found faithful. Faithful. Let's pray this evening and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for the great day you've given to us. Thank you for the many benefits, the blessings, the privileges, the grace, the mercy that you bestow upon us in such abundance. And it's just a 
like it says in Romans, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Father, we come to you dirty. We come to you as sinners. And the love and grace of God washes us clean more than we'd ever even need. It's like a fire hose. It just cleans us off. But Lord, you, be- you give us so many more benefits than just those things in our day-to-day life. Help us be good stewards of it. Help, it to- help us to reckon, to consider our time, one of our most valuable assets, if not the most. How do we spend our time? Are we giving you time? Are we giving time to our important people in our life, our spouses, our children? Our money, Lord, are we generous? Or do we just check the box off of what we give at church and then we just move on? Or are we generous? Are we good stewards of your money? Not our money, your money. Our relationships, Lord, our spouses, our children, our friends. Are we good stewards of these relationships? And Lord, high on the list with the gospel. Are we good steward of the gospel, the endless supply? Do we steward it well? Help us to consider these things. Probably each one of us, I know in my own life, Lord, things to consider, things to look at and to assess how I'm being a bad steward of the things you've given me. Help us all to consider these things and how we can improve and be a better steward of you, Lord, and the many, many things you've given us. We love you. Give us a safe drive home. Bring us back Sunday. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.